Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for yet another evening of Reader Meets Writer with SIBA. I'm your host, Wiley Cash. I'm a novelist living and working here on the coast of North Carolina, where it is blazing hot. I'm talking drooping crepe myrtle leaf hot. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight with, uh, with, uh, with a person and a writer that I admire greatly, Jill McCorkle. But before we begin, I want to say a little bit about the event. So here's how it works. You're going to watch uh, Jill talk about her book for a little bit. I have some questions for her, but you may have questions for her as well. So in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, you can click that and type in a question for Jill that I'll ask her. When you type your question in, make sure to mention two things, your name and your home bookstore, the independent bookstore that invited you, the independent bookstore that you love the most, because we would like to say your name and the name of the bookstore that you love because SIBA is representing just under 700 independently owned bookstores throughout the South. And perhaps you are here tonight because one of those bookstores invited you. So let's thank them by doing two things, mentioning their name and the questions and purchasing Jill's book, Hieroglyphics from the bookstore that invited you. If you somehow wandered in here off the street, like I've done plenty of events where you can tell the person who wandered in off the street, perhaps their feet were hurting, perhaps they're a little drunk and they have nowhere else to go and you've ended up here somehow. Still, we encourage you to buy the book. Even if you weren't invited by a bookstore, buy this book from an independent bookstore uh, that's near and dear to your heart and hopefully close by. Um, I'm really, really excited to be with Jill McCorkle tonight. Um, I'm going to read Jill's formal bio uh, in just a moment, but I would like to say that Jill has been a great influence on me, both as a writer and as a literary citizen. Uh, she is undoubtedly one of our most beloved North Carolina writers, but she's also one of our most beloved North Carolinians. Um, so without further, further ado, I'll say a few words in praise of Jill McCorkle, and uh, then we will get started talking about her wonderful new novel, Hieroglyphics. Jill McCorkle's first two novels were released simultaneously when she was just out of college. I know, that's infuriating. And the New York Times called her a born novelist. Since then, she has published four additional novels and four story collections, and her work has appeared in Best American Short Stories several times, the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction as well. Five of her books have been New York Times notable books, and her most recent novel, Life After Life, was a New York Times bestseller. She has received the New England Booksellers Award, the John Dos Passos Prize for Excellence in Literature, and the North Carolina Award for Literature. She has written for the New York Times and many, many other publications. She was a Briggs Copeland lecturer in fiction at Harvard, where she was uh, also chaired the Department of Creative Writing. She is currently a faculty member at Bennington, and she is affiliated with the MFA program at North Carolina State University. So everyone, please welcome Jill McCorkle. And Jill, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Wiley. It's a pleasure. It's great. Well, I really loved this book and, you know, I feel like it's, it's, um, it's so interesting and it's so rich. And I think that the reason for that is you have these wonderfully complex characters that are shaded in such interesting ways. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the principal characters, starting with Shelley. Sure. Um, Shelley is a court stenographer who is raising her, her young son. Her older son is off at college and she's got a young son and Shelley is, um, how to say, she's, she's a little stressed these days. Um, Harvey's father has, has left and we're not quite sure where he is and and she has lost her job because uh, while taking shorthand, she decided to just make her own notes and commentary off to the side uh, to entertain herself and accidentally turned in those notes. So she has gotten a pretty big reprimand um, and is on hold with her job. And I think you know that um, something's really bothering her. You know, she's feeling very unsafe these days mm -hmm. and and her little boy harvey um is also you know kind of getting weirded out he's convinced that a ghost is coming in their house at night after his mother's asleep 
and he's kind of obsessed with serial killers and and um animal turds and just an odd collection of things that a six-year-old kid might um be interested in and and at birth you know he had to have the the cleft palate surgery and and as a result he's self-conscious about his scar so he's always sporting a mustache you know so he has this extensive collection of fake mustaches he wears and so they are they're living in that house just kind of struggling to make it and um meanwhile an elderly couple they've they've left boston they have retired in southern pines um you know hello to the country bookstore people <laughs> um my neck of the woods i have them retire in southern pines and um frank once lived in the house Shelley now rents. And so he's a little obsessed with going and trying to get in the house. And he's married to Lil, who um, has encouraged him to go back and kind of deal with his past. He's somebody who has uh, basically closed a lot of doors and not looked. And she's a very different kind of person. Lil is someone uh, determined to see and understand every minute of her life as best she can. And what brought them together in life is they each in childhood lost a parent in a catastrophic event. Um, his dad was on a train coming home um, where this um, terrible train wreck happened not far from Southern Pines, Rennert, North Carolina. And her mother had gone to the Coconut Grove nightclub in Boston without telling anyone the night of the fire. Um, so I, I did use two real historical events set in the background of um, kind of the early childhood trauma that they connected to each other, you know, in the beginning of their relationship. And I want to ask you to read just a little bit, if you would, especially from Lil's uh, point of view, but I want to ask you before you do, or as you're finding your place, it just dawned on me that in, in you know, outside Southern Pines, uh, the Triangle area in Boston, you've really kind of hit the anchors of your own life, um, geogra the geographic anchors of your own life. So I might want to talk about that in a little bit. But before yeah. we do, if you want to read from, from Lil's uh, sex, uh, an excerpt from Lil. Okay, that's, yes. And I have, um, I've taken the liberties to, to cut and paste a little bit to put together a short reading. We all are haunted by something, something we did or didn't do. And the passing years either add to the weight or diminish it. Mine have diminished perhaps because I've spent time thinking about it all. It might sound silly, but I see these bits and pieces as my contribution to evolution, the unearthing and dusting of the prints and markers that led me here. Some seem to bulldoze right through life and up to their headstones, but I want to take my time. I want to find the right words. I imagine my recipient to be you two, or perhaps your children, and I hope this is so, rather than some stranger who comes in and hoists old boxes into a dumpster or rakes away the remainders of my life like the sad debris in the aftermath of a flood or fire. I will never get over the sight of what we left behind at our home of over 50 years to move down here. A mountain of cast off things, old towels and linens, papers and books and shoes and pots, side tables and lamps, hoses and hose, packets of seeds I meant to plant and a rubber squeak toy that had been safely hidden away in the back of my closet by one of the dogs long dead. And so much more, things not needed, things long forgotten, cans of cream of whatever soup, and V8 juice, why? And peas that had sat there forgotten for years and things that never should have been there in the first place like tuna helper 
or those things in my closet, like that geometric print mini dress I bought in the 60s, hoping to look like Petula Clark or Judy Karn, a perky pixie kind of dress that I never had the nerve to wear, and instead looked at it there at the back of the closet for years, along with a wiglet and a long frosted fall and some jackets with shoulders resembling a football player or Victorian monarch. We divided it all into goodwill, consignment, recycle, or landfill. But there were also the things I couldn't let go of. Letters, reminders, souvenirs, and I'm taking my time, relieved when I find something that might have gotten lost in that mountain of debris, like one of your drawings from first grade, or the stub from a movie I'd forgotten I even saw, or a note from my father. When the moving van pulled away that afternoon and we got in the car and turned southward, the space within the car seemed so empty, vacant, our suitcases and silver chest in the trunk, an overnight bag and thermos of coffee on the back seat. And I had that terrible feeling that I had forgotten something because I was thinking of all the times the car was filled with you two, your belongings, your music and voices, the dogs, while going to school or on vacation or just to the grocery store where I bought all of those things that I then put on the shelf there in our dimly lit pantry on the red gingham contact paper I spent one snowy afternoon 40 years ago cutting and sticking in place. All those things that I placed there and then forgot. It's mysterious how fluid time has become for me. I wake and pour a glass and have no idea what I'll find. I love um, so much about Lil's voice. And I want to say that the two there, you referenced it toward the end with them not being in the car. Those are her children. And she doesn't know quite who she's writing these letters to, these little snippets of, you know, information or memories or lists or even like cataloging of items. And a couple of days ago, we were talking about Lil specifically, and you said a line that was so beautiful and or a phrase, and you said, it's the indulgence of little memories. So can you talk about just that as a theme for the book? And not everybody's memories are indulged, but, you know, Shelley's are sometimes haunting and sometimes, you know, threatening, or at least the, the feeling she has about them. But can you talk about both in the book and in our own lives, how we indulge and nurture these little memories and protect them like little flames? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of those everyday items that are easily lost or forgotten, um, but in the moment or um, in looking back or in the aftermath of a, some kind of catastrophic event, they, they take on new meaning. And they are our kind of modern hieroglyphics. I mean, there's one example Lil gives where, you know, normally you'd throw this receipt away. Why did she keep it? She doesn't know, but now she can't because it was a day that she both had uh, bought baby food and the kind of shaving cream her father used you know, and, and it leads her to that whole time in life when you're juggling your own family and young kids and your, you know, and, and taking care of your parents. So, so she's finding meaning in all those, those little bits and pieces, you know, something that belongs to a dog. So everything becomes symbolic or represents a particular time. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm a little obsessed with, with time and memory that way. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I said in something recently, I'm, I'm one of those kids who read Our Town in junior high and, and never got over it. Um, you know, and, and those sort of looking back on those, those just ordinary days that we often take for granted and, um, so I think a lot of the excavation going on in this novel is about um, really a, a kind of celebration of some of the parts of life that um, 
that get taken for granted. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reminded of, hearing you say that, I'm reminded of William Carlos Williams writing No Ideas But in Things and how oftentimes, especially I know you have a lot of teaching experience with, with young writers, how oftentimes young writers try to layer the page full of emotion without realizing that we have to have things, we have to have physical objects to which to anchor that emotion to make it uh, relatable to other people. And in this book, I'm thinking about Frank. I mean, he is an archeologist, he is a researcher, and he's an old retired college professor who's made his living and his name and his identity picking up small items and sorting through them. And then he has this wife that he sees Lil as kind of being, you know, kind of uh, head in the clouds, just picking through the relics of daily life. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how in this novel, everybody sees the same thing differently. So can you talk about Frank and how he sees the past differently than how Lil sees it? In some ways, he's like willing to let so much go, like, oh, don't remember that or forget that about me or don't hang on to that. But then he's also clinging to, to things in his own life. So can you talk about how complicated that is? Yeah, you know, I mean, Lil, Lil says, um, you know, we're all haunted by something, something we did or did not do. And I would say that these four characters are all haunted by something. And, and as I said, you know, Shelly has just locked and barred the door and um, run from it. And, and it's just determined, you know, to blow open. Um, Frank, Frank would rather not look, you know, he, he, he feels like he's compartmentalized and, and I think it's hard for him to go back. He would rather just stay. And as I said, Lil is, Lil is someone and I actually admired this in her because I think by way of, of her obsession um, and desire to understand everything, she, she has brought her life to a kind of acceptance, even of, you know, what happened to her mother and what she, you know, all the things about her mother she has hoped to learn along the way and is always trying to learn. Um, so, by way of all of, of her work through those memories, I feel like she, she brings herself to this place where she's just um, resolved with a lot of things that, that might make Frank or Shelley uncomfortable. And then I see, you know, Harvey is just beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you were doing an archeological dig in this little corner of the world with these people who are not connected by anything except this this yard. Um, you know, it's like Harvey has found little things that Frank had hidden away as a boy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the connection. I I years ago read this um, read somewhere about how whenever uh, there's a dig at an orphanage site or where, where a school had been that it's very common to find these little caches of toys that a child might have taken and hidden. And um, just these little treasures everywhere. And, and so I was thinking in terms of that. So if, if there's sentimentality in Frank that, that lures him back to look, it's more those little keepsakes he had as a boy um, that he's lost along the way and thinks about. Yeah, he's desperate to get back inside that house. He's desperate to revisit a time in his life that in reality is kind of painful, um, not kind of, but yeah, painful and very different from his early life growing up. But as, as dismissive as he is of Lil's compulsion to handle the minutia of life, He's desperate to get in there and handle the minutia of his own life in a very private way. Um, so I'm interested in what I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, these, these real events, the, 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 the train accident and then the fire. And how did you, you know, I know that 
that writers get their ideas from all kinds of places. How did you learn about the fire? How did you learn about the train? And then say, oh, I'm going to marry these two in a novel. I'm interested in how you did that. Yeah, well, and um, I mean, you, you've, you've dealt with real events and, and suddenly it complicates everything when you're, you're needing to look up the facts. Um, but the, the train wreck was a memory my dad had from his um, young adulthood. He, w he would have been a teenager when it happened. And the circumstances of that train wreck alone are very interesting because it was snowing in Robinson County mid-December, um, which rarely happens. And then there was a freak accident with the north, um, the southbound train uh, jumped the track and and was stalled there. And and then the northbound train is just coming and, and the person who went ahead to warn slipped because it was icy, you know, broke the 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 fuse or however you say, um, to to send the warning. So it was just this series of mistakes. And, and then just this terrible crash where the train, northbound train basically telescoped and three cars crushed into one and, and it derailed and went like the length of several football fields. And, um, and my dad, you know, told me about it before I had read anything and, you know, people would go to look at the aftermath, um, you know, there were Christmas presents scattered everywhere and, and shoes and, and a wedding veil in a tree, in a pine tree, you know, which I sort of never got that image out of my mind. And, and then all the local hospitals filled and, and all the area people pitching in. Um, someone, a, a wonderful man, Horace Stacy. I named a little character after um, Frank's little brother is named for him. I put this Eagle Scout in there running telegrams, and that was that was um, Mr. Stacy who I interviewed, and he wrote me this wonderful letter. Um, all, all about what he remembered, but it really gathered the community together. It kept many people. Um, in the area, people who never would have, you know, been hanging out in that part of North, in Southeastern North Carolina and the Sand Hills, and, and they were there. Um, and so, there, you know, it was my dad's memory, but it was also my reading. And, and you can't read about it without finding the catalog of those objects and ways that people were identified, you know, a dry cleaning tag, one shoe this size, this brand, um, just, you know, a button becomes an intimate object mm -hmm. suddenly. And I just always found that so powerful. And then, you know, flash forward, I had the same response all the years I was living in Boston because people would often, you know, I would meet someone who would say, you know, somehow I would learn that her grandmother was at the Coconut Grove or knew someone who had gone to the Coconut Grove. And, and even within the past couple of years, a friend of mine up there who knew I was working on this sent me an obituary of a woman who had died and, and at the end it said, you know, on November 28th, 1942, she was supposed to be at the Coconut Grove wow. and at the last minute her plans changed. So there were all these people whose lives, um, the, the people who for whatever reason fate spared, um, you know, it, it was such a reference and then in doing the research and, and looking, you know, you, you park on 211 and you look down these beautiful train tracks. And um, I mean, there's not a trace. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you went out there and dug, you know, but, yeah. um, and, and in, in Boston, it's, it's also hard to locate 
you know, the plaque that's there now. Um, it all looks very different. There, you know, there's a hotel lobby where it would have been. There's a parking deck. Um, so I, I sort of got off track there, but anyway, I've, and, and you know, it, for years, for years, I kept thinking my main character would be someone at the Coconut Grove, or my main character would be someone on that train. And that's the, that's the kind of funny thing with fiction. I never, I don't know, I just never got my legs with that. Maybe not, not my confidence with that. I don't know what it was, but but as soon as I plugged it in as the background, kind of the wallpaper mm -hmm. of Lil's life and the wallpaper of Frank's life, um, it worked. Yeah. That's or I hope it did. I oh, it definitely worked. It definitely worked because that's those two tragedies, instead of having to get into the particulars of them in the lived moment of the novel, they're the emotional underpinning for the main characters. So the main characters get to live their lives with that as the emotional, you know, causality for the way they are. But yeah. you also don't have to do all the weedy writerly things of making the fire, the lived, which is right. so complicated to, especially a tragedy like that. Because if you're writing about tragedies like that, it can get melodramatic really easily. And that's mm -hmm. not to be dismissive, but it's so complicated trying to get that level of tragedy on the page for primary characters. Um, so I think it I think it was brilliant the way you did it. Thank um, you, thank you. I th I think we all have those markers in life, um, you know, that we're so aware of as before and after. Mm -hmm. And and once you have a a before after split and and many of them joyful, you know, the before and after of of um, your children. I've seen those two of yours running. <laughs> um, you know, it, it changes everything that came before. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so Lil, yeah, she has, she spent her whole life sort of cataloging in that way, I think. Um, and I want to remind folks, we have some questions stacking up, uh, but I want to remind folks to, to type your questions into the chat box um, now and make sure to mention your name that you want to go by and your home bookstore. We're getting a lot of shout outs to bookstores, Bookmarks, Ernest and Hadley. Um, there's Copperfish Books and Punta Gorda. Uh, there's page 158 in Wake Forest, Fiction Addiction. Um, so many, so many, too many to mention. But make sure you put your, your questions in there with your name and your, um, and your bookstore. Um, can you talk, Jill, just for a moment about how you decided to structure this novel. I mean, it's not a oh, straightforward God. linear narrative. It's got different types of writing. Um, so what kind of decisions were you making when you were trying to structure it and, and, and nail down the style and the form of it? Oh boy, um, what, what a puzzle. And uh, I, I don't know if, if she's here out there, but um, my editor, Kathy Pores, uh, I have to give a shout out there because, whoa, you know, she, the first time she saw it, it, it was just all over the place. And, um, you know, I, I, I was trying to figure out the order and I had, I had started with everyone at some point or another. <laughs> and um, anyway, we, we had just wonderful conversations that, that helped put it together. And I think, and you, you may have found this uh, yourself, you know, that oftentimes, in that first draft, we make it far more complicated than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And, and it often takes someone else's eye to say, well, does this really have to happen? And, um, no, you know, by the time you get yourself up and running, absolutely not. That did not, you know, and I often say to my students, you know, wait, before you rape, murder, pillage, stop, think, do, do you really have to do that? I mean, sometimes you do, but sometimes it's enough that someone thinks about it or, or knows, you know, the disastrous effects it would bring because, um, you know, it's more the idea 
of that. And, and so I had a couple of those places um, where, where, you know, the, my lines were very heavy. Um, and, and Kathy just has this radar, you know, it's like she, it's like she comes in with a giant eraser and you know how you smudge that pencil drawing. Um, that's, that's the kind of editing we did. And, uh, it's so satisfying and, you know, I can see it in my students work, mm -hmm. but I very often can't see it in my own. Sure. Well, Kathy's watching. She typed into the chat box. I'm here. <laughs> this is this is Kathy. And, you know, she's one of she is one of those editors that comes with a certain mystique. You know, we had Silas House on here uh, a couple of weeks ago and he said the same things about her. And so she's definitely one of those editors that are really well regarded by writers, you know, as being people who facilitate, you know, possibilities and, and, and that kind of thing. Yes. Um, I want to ask one more question before we get to questions. So I've heard you say, I've heard you speak so many times, Jill, um, and I always come away with some kind of better understanding of my approach to writing or my understanding of the craft of writing. But um, once I heard you say that you know you're ready to let go of a book when you can see the next one kind of coming towards you. And I'm wondering with this one, what were the early signs that a book, when you were finishing Life After Life or maybe a story, what were the early signs that a new book was coming towards you? Um, this, this, one, this one was uh, a little tricky because I actually had two other characters. Um, and they were the original idea. And then I sort of fired them. Um, Kathy never even saw them. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, this is a totally different, no you guys have a totally different novel. And by then, um, just thinking about Lil and Frank and the opportunity to, you know, latch on to these historical events that um, I was so taken by. Um, I just, you know, moved on. And, and this one, I have to say it was hard to let go of, um, of these guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still feeling it a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, they're I'm working on endearing, They're all such endearing characters because you, you really did a great job of nurturing this universality and both their pain and their longing that it just opens it up. Oh, there's little cracks in every one of the characters for the reader to find their way into and relate to the, to the, to the characters. Um, here's a question from Angel, who is the owner of um, Sunrise Books. And uh, let's see, she says, where did you get the idea for the court stenographer to make Shelley a court stenographer? And uh, how did you research to get it right? Oh, well, I, can you I say a little bit about about why she gets fired. Like she, she is writing something that gets her into trouble. But can you say more about what she's writing while she's doing the court stenography? I mean, well, yes. Um, you know, what what came first is just my thinking of all these different forms of hieroglyphics we have that we take for granted, you know, and I I've always been fascinated. My mother could take shorthand and, you know, it just is it's. it's it's kind of mind boggling someone who can, who can do that or, or, you know, type that fast in the courtroom. And, and so I gave her that job. And as I said, you know, Shelly's mom, Shelly, Shelly is someone who escapes the hard parts of life in her mind very quickly. And, um, and she'll get on a trail and disappear. So she, the, the trial that's going on, well, for those people who have read Life After Life, a lot of people were upset with me that I left something unsolved. Um, I think it's realistic that a lot of things go unsolved, which is why I did it. But, oh my goodness, I heard from so many people. So it's solved in this one. That's the, that's the trial that's going on. The person who killed CJ in Life After Life is on trial and um and so that was that was fun 
but the whole time that she's and this is pre this is pre Harvey Weinstein, right? You know, so so like I have like insulted this guy by calling him the white Bill Cosby, you know, and um so he he is just he has like done so many women in you know terrible ways. So the whole time that the court is going on, Shelley is writing her version of how she would write the novel, you know, so off to the side along with her grocery list and whatever else she's thinking about. Uh, she's like really, you know, venting. And uh, I had a lot of fun with that. And of, and of course, as I said, she accidentally has turned that in. So um, I just, I ended up, you know, I read enough about, I know a lot of people wear the mask where you can speak, um, but, but I, I kept Shelly pretty pure with her love for um, pencil and pad, you know, or, or the actual typing on the machine. And I love, I love Shelly because she's so, she's so frantic and her energy is so jumpy and what is it she she says i the record is 360 words and i can do 300 and she says you know i'm so, i'm so good not only did i take down verbatim the trial but i actually had time to write all my other stuff on the side like that's how good i am please don't fire me and, and another little character tick that i loved about shelly that humanized her was her compulsion how she settles herself by recounting jingles uh, from her childhood and product sayings. And that's just such a beautiful, humane touch to give a character that, you know, a less skillful writer would never be able to pluck that and apply it to a character in a way that centers them and humanizes them for the reader. So it was just really, really wonderful. No, she's um, totally tuned into words. Mm -hmm. um, big, well, I mean, I'm kind of tuned into words. <laughs> like, you know how one will catch on, like, like, like for years, nobody said cohort. And all of a sudden, everybody was saying cohort. And like lately, everybody's saying outlier, you know, and they're just these words that you go years, it's like somebody hung them up in the back of the closet, forgot about that word. And then all of a sudden somebody says, oh, I forgot about this word. And then you see it everywhere. And, and Shelly is someone who just keeps up with that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so we have a question. Uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. Rachel from page 158 in Wake Forest. She says, um, how did you write this book? Did you write a full timeline for each character or did you write the book chronologically or did you do a mixture? How did you get all these characters down? Because the book's not a linear narrative, as I said earlier. Yeah, I don't think I have ever done anything chronologically or in the right order in my life. Um, if I got assigned a paper with an outline, I had to write the paper and then do the outline. And I kind of do a novel that way. So, so a lot of times I just was writing scenes more what was emotionally driven. And, um, and then that's the real puzzle, you know, when you've got that rough draft and then you're putting it together for the final draft, the timeline becomes crucial. And that is when I really um, like to get poster board, you know, and markers and actually kind of, plot it out. And, and because the Coconut Grove fire and the train wreck are about a year apart and, um, you know, a year and a month. And so I kept, I kept getting the dates, you know, mixed up and, and so much from the forties, like what was happening, you know, or music or details. And, and so I did the emotional part first and worried about the facts, making sure the facts were right. And in fact, um, you know, in the, the, the galley, the, I think a reader found it. Um, somebody found, Kathy will remember. But anyway, I had put Jane Mansfield 
instead of Jane Wyman. There were so many Janes, you know, but I had, I had the timeline off. And, um, and so, you know, that kind of error is so easy, easy sure. to make. But, um, and that's a different part of your brain mm -hmm. that's doing the factual work. I mean, you must know this from the last ballot. I mean, you've got the real story yeah. and then you've got everything you're, you're bringing to it. And yeah. Well, I think I think your novel is a good example. You know, you mentioned Last Ballad, and I knew I had these real events, but events do not a story make. Events are just like things that happen, and that's not what stories are. But one thing that I really loved about hieroglyphics is that you have these events in the characters' lives. For example, you know, Lil and Frank move south. But that's an event, that's not a story. And so you trace this wonderful emotional narrative that threads through the novel and links all these different events for the characters. And it's seamless that we're on the tr emotional, like this collective emotional trajectory. And it's like a, like a prayer flag where the, the characters' experiences are looped on to this chain or this, this thread. It was just really, really beautifully done, Jill, so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and thanks, thanks to Kathy. Yeah, well, thank you, Kathy. She, she's here tonight. And, you know, that's kind of all the time we have. And so thank all of you for, for joining us tonight uh, for, uh, and for hearing uh, Jill talk about her new book, Hieroglyphics. Again, I want to encourage you to dance with the one that brought you and consider purchasing Jill's novel or any of her other wonderful books. Um, mm -hmm. The first time I ever heard uh, Jill read I was in college and I went to an event in Greensboro and she read a short story called, I think your husband is cheating on us. And I have never forgotten that experience. So um, all of her books are so wonderful and so poignant and so timeless, um, but especially hieroglyphics. So I encourage you to purchase a book from the bookstore that invited you and join us next time. We'll be back. Uh, let me grab this Tuesday evening with S.A. Cosby's new book, Blacktop Wasteland. This book is getting a lot of attention. A writer from Southeast Virginia. It is noir. It is a thriller. It is beautiful. It is, it is everything you want in a good read. So please join us Tuesday evening for Reader Meet Writer. Uh, I'm Wiley Cash. This has been a SIBA production, if there is such a thing. And thank you so much, Jill, for joining us. And, and thank, thank you all for being here. My pleasure. And thanks to the SIBA bookstores. Thanks. <laughs>